A sensor is one component of a process that attempts to measure some attribute of the world and generate useful data. The type and placement of the sensor is usually the most important decision, but after that comes signal processing to take that data and try to extract more useful information from it. I mean, the essential confounding problem is that the world is a complex place and many dimensions, and a sensor tries to record some property of that, and so many different processes can be superimposed into one, plus the sensor itself has noise, and the, the digital sampling process involves quantization noise both in the signal magnitude as well as time. So all of these factors together uh, mean that there can be some means to try to uh, tease out more useful data from that signal. So I'd like to try to show a few examples of how we might accomplish this on the Arduino. The filter demo sketch is a work in progress, but it has a number of individual components, all meant to be sort of simple, self-contained tools for single-channel sensor processing. And for sample data, I've been using sonar because it's one of our more useful sensors, but also quite noisy and problematic. This isn't so much about the data, this is more about a walkthrough to kind of comment on how each of these components might be used. The code itself has been coded uh, really for Arduino compatibility in the sense that it's, it's not meant to be a really well-packaged library. It's meant to be kind of cut and pasted into a sketch, but needs customization. And we'll see how that kind of plays out in the way it's coded. So this is not like general purpose code for universal signal processing. It's really designed to be used in your Arduino sketches. To, the first thing to note is it's all of these files, all the different files of the sketch are compiled into one binary. Um, we tend to use the Arduino IDE at first as writing a single file that's the self-contained program. But if you provide the Arduino IDE a number of files in one folder, it will compile them all into the output for the Arduino. There are a couple of rules about that. These are INO files, which are uh, combined using some heuristics first into one sort of module before they're compiled. And that has some, that basically means that it makes it easier to just drop a bunch of them in there and have them combined in a way that makes sense. Um, there's one file that's provided as a header file that has a slightly different syntax. So all of these things can be compiled together and used independently and, and dropped into your own sketches as you need. There is a top-level sketch here that's basically used for testing. So it runs a sonar, uh, it samples the sonar at a precise 10 hertz rate. We have to have uniform sampling for all these filters to work. And then it has a kind of demo pipeline. But that includes the sort of demonstrations of how you might apply the other components uh, into a sort of a top-level sketch for useful. So let's go ahead and start just to walk through the individual tools and get a sense of how they're used. So the statistics uh, uh, header file provides what's really an, actually a C++ class that can be used to create an object that measures some basic central measure of statistics. And this is like mean, mean uh, average, uh, the min and max, kind of running sort of uh, gross statistics about an entire timeline of the signal. Um, this is sometimes useful if you have a signal, you're not sure how it's going to be calibrated, or maybe there's some properties that are a little different session to session. Uh, you, could be used, you could use it to calculate like an average value for self-calibration or a variance indication for uh, trying to figure out what the current circumstances. Um, and it uses a, a, an accumulator technique, which uh, doesn't require much memory, just keeps track of uh, you know, a, a running sum of, of values in their squares, and then uses that to estimate a, um, a couple of statistics, uh, including the uh, average and variance. Um, this works best if the, if the signal itself has like uniform Gaussian noise, um, and then for other things you get some approximation of the, of the deviations. Next we have a kind of just some simple linear mapping. The, the, the built-in map function in the Arduino API is, uh, actually uses only integers. And so if you use it on floating point numbers, sometimes you get surprising results because the floats will be truncated to an integer value and then mapped. And that can cause severe underflow if your numbers have, have low magnitude. So fmap is exactly the same code uh, pulled out and rewritten for floating point, in which case you won't have the same kind of underflow problems. It'll take a little longer to run, but it will, uh, if, you, if you're using floating point numbers, I recommend using fmap instead of map. Um, there's a couple sorts of filters which are basically nonlinear filters which are all here under hysteresis. Hysteresis is a technical term for a kind of nonlinear property where a system uh, has some state dependence. So uh, for example, you might make a thermostat such that the, if the temperature has to sort of fall below some lower threshold before you turn the furnace on, and then it waits for the temperature to rise above some upper threshold before turning it back off again. And that's sort of built into the mechanism of the thermostat uh, 
to try to keep the, the, fil the furnace from um, turning on and off too rapidly. There's a little history there where it tries to like wait for the system inertia to kind of get up to a higher state before it then can coast back down again. Um, that's a desirable property often for trying to quantize some kind of noisy signal because a pure threshold can have a switching boundary property where if the signal's right at the threshold, it kind of chatters across the boundary and you get a lot of spurious outputs. So this is just a kind of demo of how you sort of try to code a, a separate lower and upper threshold into some signal to, um, to try to relieve some of the sort of spurious transients. This is very useful, for example, uh, yeah, if you have a kind of optical sensor where there's a, some boundary where the signal can be continuous and kind of fall right across a, a threshold line. One thing to note here is this is how the, the, code, the way the code is written is I've, instead of having global variables as per kind of typical Arduino programming convention, I'm using entirely static variables. A static variable is basically a global variable, but with limited scope. So this, this static bool output defines a Boolean variable that exists only inside this function, but is uh, kept from time to time. So it, it, it's initialized, it's started up, and then it maintains its value. So it acts like a global, but only applies in this function. The implications of this are this function can only be used in one input stream because the state of the processing is held within the function. But it, it, it simplifies the code because this is a single block you can just drop in someplace else without needing to worry about global variables or other kinds of more methods of recording state. You can customize it as you like, and there's different ways to try to generalize that to your own code. But just be aware, every one of these functions has some kind of state variables inside of it, and that means it can only be applied to one particular input stream, uh, otherwise the states would collide. Another similar kind of non example is the suppressed value, which is very much a kind of hysteresis that simply waits for an input stream to, cha to, to change only after some number of new uh, samples have been identical. So if you have an integer stream where like a, a switch that might bounce between a plus and minus or a, a true and false as the switch physically changes state, this guarantees that the, the new state has been observed some minimum number of times before, before reporting it as the new truth. And then it involves a kind of an internal history of what the previous value was. There's a slightly more elaborate uh, debouncing function. Oh, I'm sorry, suppressed value. I sort of named that code as debounce. Debounce is for waiting for an input to change in a more general way. Suppressed value is specifically for making sure that, the that a single value is not in the input stream. And uh, if th uh, the, that value appears, like let's take a zero from the sonar, then some previous value is output. Debounce is what I was talking about when I said uh, it's a logic for uh, recording the current value, waiting for the new value to change some minimum number of times before reporting it as the new truth. The smoothing filter is a kind is a kind of relatively intuitive first order filter where it tries to smooth the data by um, taking the new input, finding the difference between what the previous you know, assumed average was, and then only applying some of the new input on each cycle. So it takes some number of cycles to asymptotically approach the input. Um, and this, this ends up being a kind of method for just applying a kind of uh, simple smoothing to kind of just eliminate some noise in a signal. Um, the reason it's here mostly is because it's very legible. It's like you can see that there's one float value, which is sort of the current output as an average of signal, and then a different signal that takes the new value, finds the difference plus or minus from the previous value, and then scales that basically down usually. The coefficient needs to be between 0 and 1. The coefficient is one, there's no smoothing. Uh, the new signal minus the previous estimate will simply step the estimate to that new signal in one step. For coefficients less than one, but greater than zero, uh, there's some proportionality where some fraction of the difference is applied to the estimate and the estimate will sort of slowly drift in, in the direction of the input. For a step change, you'll get an a asymptotic uh, exponential curve that kind of tries to approximate the input. A nonlinear method of filtering is a median filter. Uh, if you have a signal that has occasional outliers, like you just occasionally get a totally wrong signal that's far away from the input, this is a heuristic filter. It's, an, it's a nonlinear filter that always looks at a short sample window, in this case, just three samples, and tries to, uh, it computes the, the median, the middle of the values. So if one value is like, particularly far away, um, that won't affect the median. The median will then be in the middle of that and the other value and uh, it'll sort of throw away the extreme outliers. Um, a three window only works if your signal is mostly good, but has like the occasional glitch, and this can help pull that out. So there's sort of a median filter, which is just, there's no, it sort of has to sort the values, and that's actually implemented with an auxiliary function that does a kind of fixed sorting on three values. 
Um, but the median records two previous values, takes the new value, sorts them into an order, and then chooses the middle one of them to return. Now we get into some sort of more complex filters. Uh, these require external code to generate. And the idea is um, it's possible to write a digital filter in very straightforward code, um, but generating the coefficients of that filter is not so straightforward. So what I'm assuming is that if you're willing to generate a, a linear filter, in this case, it's a digital uh, IIR filter that can be described by Z transforms, um, then you might be willing to run a Python script that generates the code for the filter. And that is provided separately. The Python filter script uh, uses the SciPy toolkit, the signal processing packages, to do the calculations of the coefficients. And that process is not so easy to explain. That's, that's more a topic for a kind of sophomore level engineering signal processing class and definitely involves like a bunch of math that is actually important to explain it. So this is the kind of case where you can use a tool without necessarily knowing exactly how, to, how it's actually formed. What I will point out is that the code itself is, I believe, easy to trace. So for example, this, is a, this code right here is a low pass filter. Uh, given an input signal, which is a, a number, um, it applies a couple of stages of filtering to produce a new, a new signal um, in which the high frequencies have been stripped out. And the plot kind of shows you graphically what that might look like as a plot of frequency uh, versus um, um, sort of the magnitude of the ratio output versus the frequency. In this case, a signal that's low frequency, sort of just you know one hertz or less, a very slowly frequency sig signal, will be passed through essentially unchanged. A high frequency, like a five hertz signal, will be trunk will be basically eliminated. It'll have a transfer ratio of zero, meaning that it'll be entirely removed from the input. And to see what that looks like on a real signal, here is a, a plot of a, what's it called a chirp. So this is a synthetic signal. The blue line is the input. And it's a signal that's getting progressively faster and faster. So it's oscillating back and forth. And over time, it's getting faster and faster. And the orange line is the output of the low-pass filter. So at low frequencies, we see that the orange line uh, mimics the blue line very closely with a subtle lag. It's a little bit delayed. But otherwise, the magnitude of the signal is, very, is the same. At high frequencies, the output is substantially reduced. So the orange signal is varying a tiny, tiny bit. Um, that's the, the residual output after, it's been, after that frequency, high frequency has been largely suppressed. So this is what the actual sort of time signal might look like going into and coming out of that low-pass filter. And then in the frequency space, we describe that as saying on the left is 0 hertz, on the right is 5 hertz. As the frequency increases, we see that the roll-off here um, suppresses that signal more and more as the frequency increases. So that's sort of the nature of a low-pass filter. The part that's harder to explain is um, exactly what's going on. Um, so here's a couple of things to note. First of all, there's two stages of this filter, and each has identical structure. And each has two variables of state. So the first filter section here has these two values, z1 and z2, which represent the sort of time history of the input. Two, the input is the current sample, z1 is the previous sample, z2 is two samples ago. So the basic structure of the filter is to combine those values with some coefficients. There's always some like magic numbers here. And those determine the frequency response of the filter. That's what guarantees that this filter has a, a corner frequency of one hertz as opposed to some other, other rate. And that is um, then um, uh, combined with the input. So these sort of three time samples are combined together to get a, an intermediate signal. And then the output is some composite of that intermediate signal and the time history. And then the final state is here, the z2 equals z1, means that the history is sort of shifted over. The new, the, the second oldest sample is replaced by the, the most recent old sample, and then the, that sample is replaced by the current input. And that, in, that basically implements a kind of delay line. And then the second, the second phase of the filter is the same exact structure, but with different numbers. The numbers are the hard part that's harder to explain, and it's those numbers that come out of the filter generation code. The structure of this sometimes can be better rendered. Here's a, a, just a, a plot from Wikipedia that kind of shows the structure of how the signal flows through this filter. Up at the upper left, X of N represents the most recent time sample of your input signal. So the Z minus one, this is a, a Z transformative notation for a delay line. So basically the output of Z minus one is, is sort of a one signal ago. The output of z minus 2 is two signals ago. And what's actually being stored here is not the, not the direct input signal, but this intermediate signal that's generated 
by summing up some uh, proportional weights here, A1 and A2 are the proportional weights of both the input, the sort of delayed signal, and the twice delayed signal. So that, that whole structure there generates basically the coefficient, the coefficients used to combine these delay line signals into a new intermediate signal, and then that is summed with some weights into the output signal. I'm not going to try to explain exactly why this works. For that, you should go take an engineering class in signal processing. Um, but just to say, like this is a structure which at least notionally you can look at and see, okay, you know, there's some delay, there's some coefficients, there's an input that uh, goes into the output, and I'll and take it on faith at least that that produces the kind of low-pass response. Now, there's, there's two of these sections. Each of them is a second-order filter. Altogether, it's a fourth-order filter that mostly has some, some implications about how much state there is. There's four variables. It's fourth order. And that produces a steeper roll-off. So that as the frequency increases, it sort of drops away more uh, at a faster rate as the frequency goes up. So that's a lot to say about kind of what a low-pass filter is. But in practice, what this is useful for is getting rid of a lot of high-frequency noise. The cost is there's a little delay. There can be sort of phase lag where your input signal gets experiences some delay before you see the output. But that's part of the process of trying to make a causal filter that can you know, process a live data stream and uh, produce a signal that has kind of the upper frequency noise removed. Now we're going to skip the high pass because it's very much the same structure, but it's trying to pass the, the higher frequencies instead of the lower frequencies and go straight to band pass. Now the band pass filter is actually uh, has four of these stages. There's eight variables total. Because it's a combination of a low pass and a high pass together to form a, a frequency uh, function that looks like this that passes a narrow range of frequencies. So this is saying, let's try to pass frequencies between a half hertz and one and a half hertz, sort of centered on one hertz. So constant components get stripped away. Those are zero hertz. Very fast noise gets stripped away. Those are as high as five hertz here. And then only a sort of narrow range of frequencies will get passed. And we can look at how that looks in time. Here again is the chirp. The blue signal is a signal that's going you know, slowly and then faster and faster and faster. And what we see is that uh, as it very slowly, the orange signal has very little uh, uh, transfer. There's very little signal coming out. For some range of frequencies, we get a response where the, the output is some subtly delayed, but you know, basically a, a zero shifted uh, version of the input. And then that once again starts to roll off at the high frequencies. So this is a way if you had like a periodic input, like there's some mechanical vibration you're trying to measure and you know its frequency, perhaps you could use a band pass to try to cut away both the constant signal and cut away kind of the high frequency noise and give you some response that is in a narrow range of frequencies that somehow corresponds to something meaningful in your signal. I mean, band pass filters are used all over the place in like audio processing, including like entire banks of band pass filters in things like voice recognition to pull apart a signal into smaller components that have sort of different harmonics um, you know, used as a, as, a, as a stage then for further kind of modeling. So that's, a, that's kind of a band pass. And I'll say again, for all of these things, the secret is um, if you're willing to you know, install SciPy and the signal processing toolkit and run an offline script, um, the, the filter generation script I've written that uses that toolkit um, you know, uses the cool kit to generate the coefficients, but then it outputs, you know, runnable code. The code files I'm showing you here were directly output from the script. So in kind of one step by running this offline process, you get a fixed filter that you can then use. The one downside of this is it's not tunable. There's no knob you can tune here that would change the frequency response kind of in the live system. So these are mostly useful if you have a good characterization of your data and you have some idea already of what kind of frequencies you're trying to pull out. Band stop is the reverse of band pass. It says, let's just try to notch out a certain frequency. Uh, a very narrow filter is called a notch filter, commonly used in audio engineering. If you have like a 60 hertz hum in your signal, you can make a very narrow band stop filter that tries to suppress signal components right around 60 hertz. And that can be very effective at re removing the kind of power line noise in the United States. Um, in, England, in Europe, it's 50 hertz. So that, that's a country specific kind of property. Let's look at a couple more. Um, that's, that's, in some sense, the harder ones. Um, the ring buffers thrown in here is kind of a kind of general purpose technique. Some finite filters that need a history of samples, uh, a common technique is to use a, what's called a ring buffer, where you use an array to hold a fixed number of samples. And then rather than sort of shifting all the data on every input, um, you keep a, a position value, an index, 
which always records the position that is the oldest sample. So every time a new value comes in, the oldest value is replaced and the index is advanced. So only one floating point number gets rewritten on every cycle, and then the index is updated. And so it's a ring because that index kind of goes around and around and around the buffer, and you always have some time history, only the sort of meaning of, of where in time each sample is depends upon that index. As a kind of simple example of how, how you, that is used, uh, here's a, a kind of not a very noisy derivative function, which simply takes the current and the oldest value, finds their difference, and then scales that by the sort of time difference to get a very coarse velocity estimate. It's a very noisy estimate because a single sample of noise uh, will produce sort of double noise values uh, when it is the first sample, the last sample that's included in this calculation can produce very spurious velocity estimates for just single cycles. So it doesn't do any kind of averaging over multiple samples, it just simply uses the time history. It's more a way to demo the ring buffer than being a super practical filter. Although if your input data was very, very clean, um, it actually produces a meaningful estimate of velocity. As a different way of using that same ring buffer, um, I provided another ring filter. This case is doing a median, uh, a median filter over an entire buffer. So this requires knowing a little bit more about your signal to get some sense of over what time history you might assume you have reasonable data and want to throw away outliers. Um, it's a little expensive in that it actually does a sorting op It copies all of the data into an intermediate buffer, does a sorting operation to put them in order, and then chooses the middle one from that. So you know, if you have low sample rates data that Arduino has enough computing power to do this just fine for modest data sets, but um, you, know, you run out of memory on, in some sense before you run out of computing power, um, but just to be aware that there's a sorting operation in the middle of every update. Okay, so that is uh, um, a couple examples of, of sort of, okay, I'm sorry, moving right along. So the trajectory fitting um, filter is again generated by a script. This is using a, a polynomial fitting algorithm uh, called the savitsky gole method, which is used commonly for data smoothing. In this case, it's used to make a causal filter that can operate on real-time data and produce an estimate of the position, velocity, and acceleration of a given signal um, using the most recent time history. And again, there's some magic coefficients which are coming out of the filter generator. The filter generator needs to know like the sampling rate and how long the window is, and then can produce some optimal coefficients for using multiple samples to calculate these averages. And it really is truly averaging. If you look at the coefficient, the first real coefficients, it heavily weights the most recent sample, but then has some tail of values that weight sort of samples into the past. So individually noisy samples can definitely cause noise in the output, but the position estimate uh, is averaged over multiple samples. In this case, it uses a ring buffer that's five samples long, and that's enough to get um, some kind of meaningful estimate of acceleration. Um, longer buffers can produce smoother results. Um, that buffer has to have some minimum length in order to produce any result at all. You can't compute uh, acceleration from a single sample. Um, and the buffer in this case also has to be an odd number long. So this is a case where the function is self-contained. On every cycle, it takes in a floating point input and then uh, puts that into the ring buffer, calculates new uh, fitting parameters, and then writes that into its, an output variable. In this case, output, this is C at its finest. You have to provide an array for it to, the algorithm to write into. The output variable is not an input to the function. It's a buffer in which to store the results. So the ring buffer in this case is internal to the function. Once again, this is using statics as a kind of like internal state on these functions. Um, the first stage is to like save a new sample in the ring buffer. And then there's a dot product that's formed where uh, each of the buffer uh, has, the, each coefficient is uh, multiplied with each uh, sample in the buffer. And then those are added together to perform each of the three operations of position, velocity, and acceleration estimation. Um, and then the output is written into the output array. So this is it, the the filter is set up so that the sort of the zero point of the quadratic is the current time point. Sometimes when this is used in an offline mode, um, samples are used both before and after the current time point to estimate the curve, and you can get better results that way. But of course, that only that doesn't work in real time, where you don't know the future yet. And so this is is designed to use on kind of the current time point in the recent time history. So that's a quick walk through some some filters. By the time you see this video, it's entirely possible if it's long in the future here, that there'll be other algorithms added. It's meant as a kind of a collection of algorithms for doing kind of elementary signal processing. I think the highest order comment is, 
the best way to try these things is to try them. I mean, it's, it's sometimes hard to know what a filter will do to your data. As always, it's best to collect real data from the real system, get it off the Arduino onto a normal computer, and then all of these algorithms can actually be comp uh, uh, compiled on a normal computer, or you can use the equivalent implementations in Python or MATLAB or other tools to try to investigate the different ways of processing your data. It's only by trying out these algorithms and seeing kind of what results you get that you can fine tune your, your processing pipeline. And then you can learn how to combine these in sequence to get a reasonable kind of data out of what your, what your system is generating. That takes a lot of time and experience to get right, but this is, these are all kind of atomic methods that can be used in that kind of pipeline. The last bit on the actual web page I'll just point out is there are links to all the different uh, sort of filters and scripts and things involved, including links to the various libraries that are used here. Um, and so if you do want to set this up on your own, you're going to have to install some libraries and try the Python tools. Um, you can actually test the filters offline if you have a C compiler. They're all just purely numeric operations, and say they work fine on a desktop computer. So just in summary, these are all like a grab bag of techniques for doing signal processing on single channels. And um, with some experience, perhaps you can combine them to get useful data from your sensors.